Okay, welcome to Chapter 1A, The Virtual Computing World. This is the first chapter in the Virtual Machines Companion that came with your book by Ted Simpson. Let's go ahead and get started, shall we? So, virtual machines have become quite prevalent in the corporate and production worlds, and we're going to talk a little bit about why that is, and we're going to kind of give you an overview of virtual machines in this brief lecture. Let's talk about one scenario, perhaps when you have a laptop or a desktop, but you want to be able to try out a new operating system, or perhaps you want to install an experimental application, or maybe you want to set up a server or a PC for a specific purpose and you want to not have a fully featured operating system. Maybe you're reducing the security footprint for that operating system, or you are tailoring it to a specific need. How can you do that? Well, you can do that with virtualization software. Virtualization software, or VMs as we like to say, allow us to create new operating systems without creating a separate disk partition. Normally, we have to have a separate disk partition for each operating system we run, want to run on a piece of hardware. But with virtual machines, we don't have to do that anymore. That's just one of the many advantages of virtual machines, and we'll talk about their uses in just a minute. Some other things you can do with virtual machines that are difficult, not impossible to do with operating systems uh, currently sitting on your hardware, would include things like suspending the system so that you can continue to work later. If I suspend a virtual machine, I can literally stop it where I am at that given moment, and I can go back and work from that point forward uh, at a later time. Uh, I can also create snapshots of virtual machines, and this helps us when it comes to redundancy and disaster recovery, and uh, we will talk about that uh, a little bit later as well. But snapshots allow us to return, uh, in many ways they're kind of like suspending a system, they allow us to save a present status of an operating system at that given moment, and uh, you can save that uh, to a different location and then uh, restore a virtual machine to that snapshot uh, if need be in the event of a catastrophic failure. I can also simulate a network with my virtual machines that will allow me to set up one or more virtual machines. Perhaps I want to emulate my corporate or production network and I want to use those uh, machines and to test upgrades, uh, to test patches, or to test uh, new uh, applications before I actually put them in the production environment and see how they work, whether they work well together before I actually break something. Um, there are two leading software manufacturers for VMware today. VMware, which is the kind of got a lead start on VM products, uh, they still are considered the leading manufacturer. Though Microsoft has made great strides and is trying to catch up with their virtualization products as well. So when we talk about virtualization hardware or VMs, virtual machines, what are we talking about? Well, VMs emulate a separate hardware environment in an existing operating system environment. They allow me to not only install a separate operating system, but I can emulate a hard drive or di dictate how much memory I want to run that VM on. Uh, I can emulate NIC cards. I can change the IP address so separate from my host machine. I can set up peripheral devices on that VM, whether it's US through USB ports, LPT or COM ports, um, such that I can fully emulate a separate machine on the host computer. When I talk about a host computer, by the way, I'm simply referring to the physical computer that runs the virtualization software. Typically, uh, for you folks, that would be your laptop or maybe your desktop. That would be the host computer. The VM, the virtual machine itself, is referred to as the guest computer. It is the operating system running in the virtual environment created by the virtualization software. Now, a virtual machine in and to itself consists of two sets of files stored on the host computer, the configuration files and the virtual disk file. A configuration file contains the configuration settings for that virtual machine. These settings include, but are not limited to, the virtual machine name and the access rights, the location of the virtual disk file, 
the amount of memory to be used by that virtual machine. How much RAM on that host machine will be allocated to that virtual machine? The network settings, of course, are a part of the configuration settings, and we'll talk about those uh, later. And many other device and security settings are also incorporated into these configuration files. The virtual disk files are used by the virtualization software to emulate a virtual machine's hard drive. And this could either be one large virtual disk file, uh, or it could actually be a series of virtual disk files that are equal sizes. Uh, that's an option that you have when you create the virtual machine as to how you want these files segregated out. And uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to each way of setting it up. Now, the host computer, CD-ROM, keyboard, and mouse are all shared by the virtual machines on that host computer. And that host computer's total RAM is the local operating system plus the amount of RAM allocated to each virtual machine environment. So if your computer has 4 gigs of RAM and you allocate 3 gigs to your virtual machine environment, that means that your host computer only has 1 gig of RAM that it can use to run its operating system and whatever host applications are running at that given moment. Therefore, it's important to realize that the amount of RAM on your computer is one of the deciding factors about how well it will allow virtual machines to run on that host computer. Virtual machine environments are managed and configured using an administrative console and that's part of that virtualization software layer. The, for you folks that would be VMware Player, but uh, there's other virtualization software uh, administrative consoles out there. Um, we'll talk about a few of the VMware products at least uh, before we finish our lecture. Now, usually uh, when it comes to VMs, the same rules apply that they do to host operating systems. A virtual machine, by all rights, is a separate machine. Therefore, you usually have, if you have to have a license for one operating system, if you are creating that operating system in a virtual environment, you'll have to have a license for it as well. So if you are running an XP virtual machine on an XP host computer, you need to have two licenses in order for you to be completely legal. Now, as far as virtualization products, the types of products, we classify those into four classifications. Workstation, server, application, and hardware. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of those. When we talk about virtualization of a workstation, we are talking about uh, virtualizing something that's designed to be used on a personal computer in order to run multiple desktop environments for the user. Uh, that means that virtual machines are going to be user-oriented rather than server-oriented. Likewise, uh, one of the key applications that we use in the workstation and virtualization arena is VMware Player. It's actually what we use in our program uh, for our students to run virtual machines in the classroom. VMware Player, I think we're up to uh, version 4 or higher at this point, runs existing virtual machines that have been created. I can also create virtual machines with VMware Player and we'll uh, talk a little bit about that in another lecture. Virtual machine uh, workstation virtualization is designed for development, testing, training, and end-user systems. Now when we talk about server virtualization, likewise we are emulating a physical computer's hardware on a host operating system. But with server virtualization products, we are using products that are specifically designed to run servers. That means that they are designed to improve performance and reliability so that several servers can run on a single system. Now this means reduced hardware cost, ease of server specialization, and improved disaster recovery in our corporate and production environments. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. 
Another uh, great thing about virtualization is it helps us prevent server sprawl. Now, what is server sprawl? Well, in the past, many applications and departments shared a single server environment, i.e. they shared the same box. Now, this led to complex server configurations, reduced performance, and complicated maintenance and upgrading. Let's refer to that as the dark years, shall we? So, IT administrators got smart and they said, well, in order to prevent complex server environments, uh, that makes it difficult to upgrade them, can't maintain them. Uh, let's just go ahead and for each of these specific tasks, let's just put it on a separate server. We have multiple servers and each one is specialized for specific applications. So it's not uncommon in IT departments to have many different servers, maybe two, three file servers, your email server, you have some database servers, you've got your intranet and then your web server, and they're all pieces of hardware and they're all in a rack. Well, over the years, that trend has increased and as more applications and specialized environments were required, that meant more and more pieces of hardware in the rack, right? So that created server sprawl. Server sprawl uh, has been reduced because now we can put multiple virtual machines into one hardware box. And that makes us reduce the amount of hardware costs associated with running multiple servers. Um, servers are expensive and when you have to replace them every three to five years and you're replacing eight to ten pieces of hardware that's a lot of uh, a lot of costs associated with that not including the initial configuration costs and all associated so virtual machines helps reduce that also we don't need as much space because now I can run multiple virtual machines on say an ESX server machine designed just for running virtual machines and I only have to have a very small piece of my rack devoted to that and that means I have a lot more space available. Uh, it also means that I have reduced my power consumption and maybe even my network co connections. Uh, my power consumption, well, think about running 20 virtual machines and I reduce that to half because of virtualization. Well, now I'm cutting my power consumption down to almost half. So that, uh, and, we, and air conditioning as well, all those machines put out a lot of heat. So anything I can reduce those costs is going to save my IT department a lot of money. Most server class computers in today's environment, the hardware was running really only 15% utilization anyway. So by running virtual machines on the hardware, I can maximize my efficiency on my hardware boxes. So let's talk about finish let's finish up these benefits of implementing server virtualization well i can decrease my hardware costs i can decrease my facility power and air conditioning costs i can simplify network connections there are other benefits though that are associated with virtualization products and we've touched on them throughout the lecture first off let's talk about that disaster recovery well if i'm running a virtual machine and I can take snapshots of that virtual machine and say it gets infected by a virus or there's a catastrophic failure of the machine. All I have to do, whereas before I would have to strip down that machine, the hardware, reinstall the operating system, all the applications, or and then run backups to fill in my data, that could take uh, several hours to, to implement and reconfigure it as well. Don't forget that part. But with my virtual machine if I'm taking regular snapshots all I have to do is find the latest snapshot start it up in the virtual machine environment and away I go and I'm up and running maximum downtime 10-15 minutes as long as I don't have to rebuild the host machine I'm in good shape and if I have to rebuild the host machine because of it I still don't have to rebuild all those other servers that would have been affected so that uh, that minimizes my downtime during disaster recovery. And I can save those snapshots anywhere I want to. On another network drive, I can save them on a disk or tape and have it shipped out. It's a great way to improve the redundancy and reliability of your system. All right, 
So another uh, great advantage, as we talked about, is maximizing the efficiency of your hardware environment because the more virtual machines I can run in my hardware environment without degradation, uh, the more efficient uh, I become at running those hardwares. Virtual machines are great for creating test environments. Um, a test environment is something that every IT shop should have, whether uh, it's a hardware-based or, in this case, a virtual-based test environment. That allows me to test upgrades, uh, test uh, patches, new applications. Uh, all these things should be tested in a test environment that is as close to the hardware environment as possible before I actually push it out into the production environment. And virtual machines are a fantastic way of doing that. I can also use virtual machines from a security perspective. I can use a virtual machine, for instance, to see what happens when a new virus infects it without having to worry about infecting my host computer. And I can isolate that virtual machine off the network so I don't have to worry about damaging any other systems on the network and I can still watch what happens and then restore that virtual machine with a snapshot back to its original condition. Virtual machines are very versatile. Now application virtualization, uh, another one of the areas of virtualization, is a little different. As your book says, Application virtualization is a new type of virtualization technology that you should be aware of. And we use this type of virtualization to run applications that will not affect the host computer's operating system environment. Now, it's different from the workstation or server virtualization categories because we don't actually create a separate virtual machine that will provide a virtual hardware environment. Instead, we use abstracts in the file system and registry uh, for that virtualized application. And you can run multiple versions of the same software on your computer without leaving a footprint of the virtualized application. It's a, a quite a new way of running an application. There are some benefits to this. Since the application doesn't have its own registry or file system, uh, you can install and run those applications without causing conflicts with any other applications on your computer, and you don't have to worry about it corrupting the registry and therefore making it almost impossible to remove it from the operating system. So there are two types of virtualization products that kind of overcome the market. There's Softricity, SoftGrid the desktop, um, now Microsoft now owns that, and then there's Altria Software Virtualization Solution, or SVS for short. Now SoftGrid Desktop virtualizes all aspects of the application package and offers some advanced features over the Microsoft piece. Um, including streaming application deployment, pre-packaging of virtualized applications, but you do have to have Microsoft Active Directory in a physical server environment, which means that typically SVS is kind of limited to the larger organizations. Now when you hear people talk about hardware virtualization, you're basically talking about the process of AMD and Intel going through to create processor chips that will actually do part of the virtualization process within the chip itself. Now this is at the hardware level. This is something that they're doing to accommodate virtual machines, virtual server technology. Why? Because in the past when you run virtual machines it does tend to eat up a lot of CPU usage and that does mean that there you can actually see some performance degradation because of this. Well, Intel and AMD and other chip manufacturers have gotten wise to this and now they are creating some chips, in this case uh, IVT or AMDV chips, which are designed to accommodate virtual machines and therefore enhance their performance. Okay. Now before we move on, I do want you to be aware that uh, you need to be aware of the different types of hardware configuration settings between pages 10 and 16 in the Virtual Computing World chapter. Uh, these 
Hardware configuration settings include things like the processor and motherboard chipset, the memory settings, which ports to use, the COM LPT or USB ports, and of course CD-ROM devices on a virtual machine. We use CD-ROM devices of course to transfer data still. We use CD-ROM devices to install an ISO image file. An ISO image file, when we talk about ISO image files, we're really talking about files designed to set up virtual machines or to set up um, an operating system. Uh, Microsoft puts out ISO files all the time for all of its Windows products and we can use, we can burn an ISO file onto a disk and use that disk to install an operating system. Likewise with virtual machines I can do the same thing. I can save an ISO image file to the hard drive for instance and use that file to create a virtual machine using VMware Player. But be sure to read up on all this through 10 through 16. I'm not going to take the time today to cover this in the lecture. We're going to move on. One of the great things about virtual machines is the ability to save the virtual machine state or the VM state. That allows me to return to a specific task at any point uh, while I'm working on the virtual machine. I can just simply save the VM state and then go back to it at a later time. This is common to all virtualization products. It's uh, one of the greatest features about VMs. Now VMware has an additional capability called a snapshot. We talked about snapshots earlier. This contains the virtual machine's data and settings up to that point. VMware server, for instance, can only have one snapshot at a time. When a new snapshot is taken, the new snapshot will replace the previous one. Now, VMware Workstation contains a snapshot manager. That allows me to create multiple snapshots. They can coexist, and I can allow them to return to any saved state as long as I've got a snapshot for it. Another useful feature in virtual machines is something called parenting and cloning. This is very useful in educational environments such as Durham Tech. We use parenting and cloning to distribute a common machine to all the students. Now, with parenting and cloning, only changes are saved on cloned machines. The parent disk will always remain unchanged. That's why it's called the parent disk. Microsoft uses a technique called differencing disks to create a cloned disk drive. And the differencing disk points to a parent disk that contains only the, and it will only contain the changes. So you have to have the parent disk and then the differencing disk it will refer to the parent disk and then add the changes. Parent disks should only be read only. That prevents them from being overwritten. And VMware Workstation 6 and higher clones computers. VMware Server does not, however, support parenting or cloning. That's part of the reliability factor of server. You don't have all the bells and whistles. All virtualization products also support two network modes. Actually today you see more often three network modes. One of them is not listed here in the lecture but we'll talk about it. Local mode which is when a virtual network adapter does not connect to the outside world it only sees the host computer. There's bridged mode. Bridged mode allows the virtual network adapters to be connected through the host computer's physical adapter to the outside network, but it will actually appear as a separate computer to other devices on the physical network. That means with bridged mode, I can have a separate IP address for my VM, a separate MAC address, and so on. And that means that in all rights on the network, it is a different machine and I can it will be switched, data will be switched to that machine as a different machine. The only commonality is that it's using the same physical NIC card to transfer the data. The other node which is not mentioned here is something called NAT mode or network address translation. Some of you may already be familiar with network address translation. That is when we take a network card and we change the network settings for devices connecting to that network card or or um, 
in any way, shape, or form such that anything on the network card is hidden. So in, when we talk about network address translation for a virtual machine, what we're saying is that any virtual machine using NAT mode as its network mode will have its IP address and its MAC address hidden to any other device on the physical network. So when data comes into that NIC card and it's for the host machine, it, the data will come in with the IP address of the host machine and it will be up to the NIC card to differentiate the data between the host machine and your virtual machine. This means that your virtual machine is hidden from the network. Uh, it's one way of providing a secure environment for a virtual machine. However, that's not a friendly way to do things like Active Directory management and things of that nature. So uh, typically when we work on uh, VMs, we usually keep it in bridged mode. VMware Workstation typically is going to have the most advanced features. Uh, this will include Snapshot Manager to support the multiple snapshots. We talked about that earlier. It does support cloning. It does support sharing files with the host computer. And it will support USB 1 and USB 2 devices. You can use Workstation to support local bridged and NAT adapters. VMware Player will do it as well and you can use up to four network adapters with Workstation. Support for several virtual hard drives, up to four ID virtual devices, uh, and several SCSI drives is included in Workstation. And with Workstation, you have to buy it. It's not a free item, and you have to have a purchasing license for that. VMware Server is free. It does not have the bells and whistles that Workstation does, but part of that is in order to provide a reliable connection for your server infrastructure. It does provide good for support for both server and Workstation-based guest operating systems. It will support advanced server functions such as clustering. It will support uh, one snapshot per server. It does support USB 1 devices uh, and now it does support two devices, uh, USB 2.0 as well. And supports local bridge and NAT network adapters. Up to four network adapters, host adapters can be connected using the VMware server product. And support for several virtual hard drives including up to four IDE virtual drives and several SCSI devices. Now, virtual, I mean, a VMware server does not support sharing files between the host and guest operating systems, nor does it support cloning, which you would think it would, considering it's a server-based structure, but it doesn't. All right, so let's take a look at VMware Player, shall we? All right, so here's an example. Uh, we're going to launch a virtual machine for you guys today. I have one just so happens right here. Uh, and I'm going to, in this case, launch uh, Windows Enterprise Server 2008. Now, I am going to launch this on my Windows 7 uh, laptop. And, and I do want to point out some things here for you. Um, what you see from here up, these are log files. And then these one, two, three, one, two, three, four files are part of the configuration files. This is the RAM file. Um, this file with the three little windows here, the VMX file, this is the actual file that you're going to launch. It's the equivalent of the, of the executable file for this machine. It does have some configuration settings in it as well. Um, these right here from here down, I opted to have my hard drive split or segregate separated into equal pieces in this case there's 320 kilobytes a piece now uh, in this instance you notice that some of these are higher than that that's because they actually have stored data on them and this is no different than any uh, your physical hard drive uh, this virtual hard drive does rest on your physical hard drive it's just simply allocated space and as you um, fill this virtual drive, you will be filling up, putting data on your host hard drive. So let's go ahead and launch this machine. I have the license agreement, uh, yes, accept the terms. 
What's opening right now is that virtual uh, VMware Player application launcher. Now, in this instance, because I have moved this machine to this uh, laptop, it's asking me, did I move the machine or am I copying the machine? If uh, I want to create this machine, uh, or I've recreated this machine, and I want it to be considered a separate machine with a separate security ID, then I would choose I copied it. If uh, I have chosen, if I'm simply literally moving this machine and, and it's the exact machine, exact machine name, etc., then I would say I moved this machine. Here are some devices. It, it does me the courtesy of letting me know which devices or peripherals I can actually connect to the machine. Um, and the machine is starting up. I can expand it just like that. Since this is VMware Player, uh, there I can go to the virtual machine and here is where I would change the power settings. So I can go in, I can reset it, I can suspend it, I can turn it off. I can change my removable devices here and the virtual machine settings is where I can go in and actually make physical uh, changes to the hardware specifications on this virtual machine and here I can allocate how much of my RAM I want to run on this machine or run for this machine as you can see this machine is only taking up a small portion of the window I can go into the machine I can change the resolution such that it will fill my window but I'm not going to need that for this demonstration as you can see the Windows Server 2008 is starting just like uh, it was a hardware server it's doing the same checks and the same uh, setups uh, associated with any Windows Server 2008 box that I would start up. And there you go. Now I'm, I'm just like I'm logging in. Now I have to click the mouse on here just to remind the computer that this is the box that I'm talking to. And instead of Control Alt Delete, when you're logging into a virtual machine, you want to do Control Alt and Insert. Here I can put in the password. And since this uh, machine does not have a uh, valid license code and it's expired, it won't let me use it. But anyways, it logs in just like a regular machine. And it's just that simple. So this is a, a quick uh, kind of demonstration of VMware Player. I can go in, like I said before, I can go in, I can power this off. And I'm back to the original VMware Player screen. If I'd launched VMware Player itself, it would um, have come to this screen. Now in VMware Player, I can create a new virtual machine. I simply click on here and then I can either choose an ISO image by clicking there and browsing to it or I can use an installer disk. I can also open a virtual machine by browsing to it and recently opened virtual machines will be listed over here on the left hand pane. Okay well that's the quick and, and dirty tour of VMware Player and we'll talk more about virtual machines and you'll get a chance to use some of these throughout uh, the course this semester. Okay, that's all I have for uh, the first part or lesson 1A. Uh, next lesson, or it's a very short lecture, uh, lecture 2A will be next.